Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 16th Annual Ward Summer Student Research Day. My name is Tom Chow, and I'm the Vice President of Research at Hollenberg Blue Kids Rehabilitation Hospital and Director of the Blue View Research Institute. Before I start, I'd like to remind everyone to keep their audio and video muted during today's virtual event. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we are on. We acknowledge the sacred land on which we are on today. This land, Mother Earth, our Earth Mother, is the territory of the Huron Wendat First Nation. The Seneca as part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Mississauga of Scugog Island First Nation. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. And I was pondering this acknowledgement. I was thinking the land is so much more than just a place with a name. It's truly where we learn. Um, many of us learn to walk on land, live, play, fall in love. If the land affords us food that nourishes us physically, it provides us the sights, sounds, and smells that guide our brain development. The land stimulates the scientist to marvel at the complex beauty of nature. The fractals of tree branching and river deltas, turbulent and laminar flow of our many great rivers, the golden spiral of Romanesco broccoli, the beautiful patterns of snowflakes and the veins of leaves. The land is truly a delicate, an intricate gift for us to treasure and cherish. I personally pledge to continually learn about Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous ways of inquiry and knowledge sharing. So I would like to extend a warm welcome to our award students, their families and friends, to our researchers, family leaders, and the rest of our Research Institute and Holland Blurview community. A special thanks to our generous donors, the Ward Family Foundation and CIBC. Without their support, these opportunities for our research students would simply not exist. Today, we celebrate the research achievements of 20 incredible students who were handpicked from more than 1,800 applicants from across Canada. I'm especially proud of our scientists and staff at the Bolivia Research Institute who have supported summer students throughout the pandemic. We were in fact the only hospital to go without interruptions to undergraduate summer student research training in 2020 and 2021. This year, we returned to some in-person summer students activities while others joined remotely. For the past three months, all of you summer students have been working closely with our talented scientists and postdoctoral fellows and graduate students. And I'm sure that your research horizons have been brought in immensely from the insights you have gleaned, such as the lunch and learns on career paths in research, the family and research experience, and creating accessible research posters. Throughout this summer experience, I hope you have had the opportunity to connect with your peers and to learn from one another. I know that we at the Blueview Research Institute have benefited greatly from the knowledge, enthusiasm, talent, and energy that you have brought to help us create a world of possibilities for children and youth living with disabilities. Your research contributions across many of our labs and working with our scientists will help further the evidence base of childhood disability, which in turn will help direct, uh, well, sorry, will in turn directly impact our clients and families here at Holland Blueview and elsewhere. You're all making a difference and we are grateful that you are sharing your talents with us this summer. I'd also like to thank the scientists and staff for their continued mentorship and dedication over the last 16 years to this program and to many other student program initiatives here at Holland Blurview. Now I'd like to invite Alan Marriage from our foundation to share a few words. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Holland Blurview Foundation, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Colin Ward uh, and the Ward Family Foundation who are here today. This foundation has generously funded the Ward Summer Student Program for the past 16 years, as well as the annual Pursuit Awards for many years. Uh, 
Uh, Colin is a former Holland Bloorview client who has benefited from the services here at the hospital. And thanks to his family's generosity, many students have had the opportunity to learn and contribute uh, their expertise to the exciting field of childhood disability research. A very special thanks goes out as well to CIBC for supporting the ward summer student opportunities with the lived experience and Indigenous streams. Thanks to CIBC's generous support, these students have had the opportunity to learn more about the field in research and pediatric rehabilitation while being mentored by some of the world's top scientists in the area. I'd like to invite uh, Ronan Ryan, Senior Director of Community Partnerships and Executive Director at the CIBC Foundation to say a few words. Welcome, Ronan. Thank you, Alan, and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ronan, and I'm the Senior Director of Community Partnerships at CIBC and the Executive Director of the CIBC Foundation. And really delighted to be joining you all this morning in this uh, incredibly cel celebratory uh, meeting. So at CIBC, our ambition is to create social and economic opportunities for everyone. And since 1989, CIBC and the CIBC Foundation have proudly donated more than $2.6 million to Holland Bloorview to support your mission of creating a world of possibilities for children and youth with disabilities. And honestly, we're everybody at CIBC is continuously inspired by the innovative work and research being done at Holland Bloorview by the exceptional team there, and we are completely proud to support your ambitions. We're in particular excited to see undergrad students gain valuable experience in this field of childhood disability research through this unique summer program, including those with lived experience and indigenous youth through the CIBC supported streams, which will provide students with interdisciplinary mentorship, as Alan was saying, within the field of childhood disability research. And we're really looking forward to seeing successful candidates impact on all our communities in the future. Together, through programs like this, we do really continue to make progress towards our goal of helping to create a world without limits to ambition. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Ronan. Oops. Thank you, Ronan, for your remarks and for CIBC's continued support of our lived experience in the Indigenous streams within the Ward Summer Student Program. I'd like to introduce our co-host for today's competition. Uh, Manny Kang is Blueberry Research Institute's Director of Research Operations and Business Development. Manny has kindly agreed to step in when our youth co-hosts couldn't make it at the very last minute. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to say a, good, a few good things about Manny. Manny is the adhesive that holds our research institute together and keeps the research institute machine running. His portfolio covers a lot of ground from leading a team of more than 20 research operations staff, oversight of the administrative side of the house to brainstorming new ways to grow the research institute, such as how to operationalize Canada's first multi-organ imaging bank in pediatric disability. Please kindly extend a welcome to Manny. Thank you, Tom, and good morning, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. A bit spontaneous uh, decision to co-host with you guys, but this is my favorite event because nothing really exudes uh, the future more than uh, watching our undergraduate research students uh, sort of present their uh, 12 weeks worth of incredible findings and work. So thank you. I look forward to the rest of the event uh, and co-hosting with you, Tom. Thank you, Manny. So very soon we'll hear from our 20 ward summer students and via virtual uh, presentations. The students have been clustered into four groups this year. And after each group of presentations, judges will ask each student a question uh, to which they will have one minute to answer. And once the judges wrap up their questions, the audience will have a chance to participate. You'll get to answer questions that the students have come up with uh, to test your knowledge about their research. So do pay close attention to their presentations for your chance to win. And Manny is going to explain how to play the quiz. Okay, so to play the quiz, uh, we're going to be using an online platform called Kahoot. Uh, so what we're going to ask you to do is type in kahoot.it, so that's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T, into your internet browser. You can do this on your phone or you can do it on your uh, computer if you have a separate browser open. 
And you'll see a purple web page, sort of like the, the slide that's up here with a text box that should show um, where to enter the game pin. So when we actually start the online quiz portion of today, uh, the game pin will show up on our screen here uh, and you can enter that number and you're in the game basically. And, and you'll get to answer a series of three multiple choice questions based on the research presentations you just watched. And the person with the most correct answers wins and their name is shown on the leaderboard. And there is a prize, so it gets quite competitive sometimes. Uh, to claim your prize, the winner uh, will provide their full name as well as their email address to our uh, chat box here. And uh, we'll be in touch with you to claim your prize and keep this game sort of handy, whether it's on your phone or a separate browser, because we're gonna have a couple of rounds of uh, the quiz portion of today's event. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Manny. So just to sum up over the next hour and 45 minutes, uh, each student will give a short presentation followed by Q&A with our judges and then the Kahoot quiz that Manny just explained. Uh, subsequent to that, we'll have a virtual research booth session where uh, everyone will go into different virtual breakout rooms to chat with our students and learn more about their research. More instructions will follow on that part. And then finally, we'll close with an award ceremony to announce the best uh, research poster and best oral presentation. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge all of our judges uh, for their efforts and time in reviewing the incredible research of our summer students. And here you see the list of judges. So many thanks. Uh, Manny will now introduce the first five uh, student presenters. Okay, great. So I'm excited to present you the first five. Uh, we have Margaret Jurin, Clarissa Yu, Katrina Meng, Erin Leo, and Taryn Simon joining us for the first round of presentations. Hi, everyone. My name is Margaret Jurin, and in this presentation, I'll walk through some of the research that I did this summer with the Autism Research Center as a ward student. So we know that everyone is born with a different personality, even before their higher cognitive functions and learned values come into play. There are distinct ways that a person consistently feels and behaves throughout their life. These individual differences that are biologically based can be referred to as temperament. And this characteristic is frequently assessed using three underlying dimensions, surgency, negative affect, and effortful control. You may have also heard of emotional regulation, the ability to monitor and modify one's arousal. In the commonly used emotional dysregulation index, EDI, there are two subscales through which manifestations of a child's dysregulation can be assessed, reactivity and dysphoria. Emotional regulation is usually viewed functionally and is often assessed based on behavioral responses. The question that we looked to answer was this, is there an association between the temperament profiles and the emotional regulation capabilities of children with ASD? So using linear regression to analyze the scores of 51 children with an ASD diagnosis on these two measures, the temperament and middle childhood questionnaire and the emotional dysregulation inventory, we found that yes, there was a statistically significant positive association between the negative affect dimension of temperament and both subscales of the emotional dysregulation index. That is, a child with ASD who displays a negative affect, meaning they frequently feel fear, anger, sadness, and discomfort, is more likely to show high reactivity. So that's intense and rapidly escalating emotional reactions and dysphoria, reactions displaying sadness or nervousness. So why is this important and how does it apply to research and treatment of clients happening here at Hall & Bloorview? These results allow us to identify that a biologically based characteristic seen from very early life, negative affect, is correlated with emotional dysregulation manifestations later on. And this could help inform treatments and interventions for children with ASD that acknowledges the linkages between their nature and behaviors they may display and could help parents and caregivers understand these associations. So if you want to learn more about temperament and emotional dysregulation in children with ASD, I welcome you to come visit my poster, number one, and ask me any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. What is it about hospitals that help us heal? You may think about the who, healthcare professionals, the what, treatment, but what about the where? Do you consider the architecture and design of physical spaces and healthcare settings? 
do you think about who the spaces are designed for and how they're used? These considerations relate to the healthcare built environment, which research has shown to affect patient outcomes, satisfaction, and the quality of care. Children with disabilities represent one population that may have unique experiences with healthcare built environments due to their age, disability, and potential frequent visits. Their experiences and perspectives are important and may provide valuable insights to improve pediatric healthcare spaces. We therefore pose the question, what does the literature tell us about the experiences of children with disabilities and their families in pediatric healthcare built environments? To engage this question, we conducted a scoping review. Five databases were searched with search terms related to children, disability, healthcare, and built environment. A total of 6,464 records were identified and screened, from which 19 texts were included. A review of the included texts identified four themes related to built environment needs and preferences among children with disabilities and their families. First, children prefer age and sensory friendly play opportunities, for example, playrooms. Children and families also value shared spaces, such as lounges and gardens, as they foster social engagement to help cope with hospitalization. Building design features supporting privacy, such as single rooms, and adequate space for parents are also important to children. We also found that little research has considered the experiences of children with developmental disabilities and healthcare spaces. This research presents an opportunity for Hall and Bloorview to improve current and future hospital spaces in ways that are informed by the experiences of children and families. This, in turn, may help ensure that Hall and Bloorview's built environment enhances client experiences and contributes to improved quality of care. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katrina, and I'll be presenting my work on 3D printed prosthetic sockets. Prosthetic sockets serve as the interface between the residual limb and the prosthetic device. And diagnostic sockets are transparent and heat moldable, which allows clinicians to assess the fit on the client. The traditional fabrication process is labor and material intensive, time consuming, and highly dependent on the skills of the prosthetist. On the other hand, the proposed digital method has several potential benefits, such as improved efficiency and data-driven results. There are several challenges preventing widespread clinical adoption of the digital workflow. One challenge is translating the clinician's handcrafting skills to digital design. Secondly, achieving transparency and thermal formability have not yet been explored in 3D printing. And finally, minimal research has been done on transradial socket design. The objective of my research is to develop a process to digitally create transradial diagnostic sockets. We collaborated with clinicians in the orthotics and prosthetics department to create a step-by-step -step process to digi digitally design the socket. Next, we analyze the socket shape to predict how well the socket will fit and refine the creation process. Finally, we 3D print these sockets to try on clients for both client and clinician feedback. When 3D printing the diagnostic socket, the clinicians want a material that is rigid, transparent, and heat moldable, so they're able to make modifications to improve fit. We experimented with adjusting the material, socket thickness, and different post-processing techniques to achieve these objectives. After following these methods, we were able to streamline the digital process and 3D printed more than 20 sockets. So far, we've tested on two Holland Blurview clients, and we learned that more work is needed to provide optimal fit. On the 3D printing side, we received positive feedback from the clinicians. They were able to go through their clinical assessment process and reported that the material properties are on par with traditional methods. This project is one of the first in Canada to provide clients with a 3D printed upper limb prosthetic socket. Digital technologies have the potential to revolutionize the prosthetics and orthotics industry and improve accessibility to services around the world. We hope to implement this workflow at Bloorview to continue providing clients with high quality evidence-based care. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Aaron Leo. and Today I'm going to be presenting a software to enhance the development of Brink Computer Interface Data Process Pipelines. Before I get into my project, a little bit of context. 
Brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, are communication technologies that allow users with disabilities and complex communication needs to communicate using only neural activity. BCI research has expanded greatly in recent years as a viable and accessible means of communication for individuals with neuromuscular impairments. In order to communicate using a BCI, the user's brain signals must first be processed before a specific command or thought can be extracted. Yet, there are significant technical competencies and time investment requirements to build these processes that frequently impede researchers. Thus, it is the goal of this project to address the following question. How can a software design tool reduce technical barriers to BCI design and development? The developed tool is composed of two elements, a drag and drop style visual interface depicted on the right of your screen that allows users to generate their custom processing pipeline and a software library backend to conduct the mathematical processing. Both components were developed in Python using various open source data science libraries to support the backend and the QT framework for visual element development in the front end. The developed program BCI Pi allows designers to allocate more time to experimenting with novel pipelines instead of concentrating on the code or infrastructure behind a particular BCI. To build a standard BCI, a standard processing pipeline, a developer would need to write, let's say, 300 lines of MATLAB code. This is reduced to just 50 lines using the backend and just eight drag and drop visual elements with no lines of code with the visual interface. BCI Pi enables the development of BCIs with minimal programming expertise. Consequently, the tool aims to foster research into applications of BCI and expand their clinical usability. In the future, BCI Pi may be expanded to include other elements, like built-in simulations for further experimental capability. The software is especially relevant in the context of pediatric care research. Through BCI Pi, designers can more easily develop alternative communication pathways for pediatric clients with communication challenges. Furthermore, the tool provides an opportunity for individuals without extensive programming experience, like clinicians and scientists, to more actively engage in BCI development and research. I'd like to acknowledge my supervisor, Nicholas Ivanov, for guiding me through this project, Dr. Chow for making this opportunity possible, and all Holland Blurview staff and students who enhanced my experience this summer. Feel free to come check me out at poster number four if you have any questions or would like to continue the discussion about my project. Thank you. Have a good day. Hi everyone, my name is Taryn and I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Darcy Failings in the CP Discovery Lab on a project looking at parent-mediated interventions for promoting participation in children with physical disabilities. Early in life, participation is an avenue through which children learn, develop skills and interests, and form relationships. Children with physical disabilities have restricted participation, participating less frequently and often choosing more home-based and sedentary activities. With restricted participation starting early in life, parent involvement in promoting participation may lead to increased participation that can be maintained through development. We are conducting this research because to our knowledge, there is a gap in the literature regarding how effective parent-mediated interventions are in promoting participation and what the secondary impact is on child psychological well-being. My research aims to synthesize the evidence and determine whether these interventions are effective in improving child well-being outcomes. So my project is a secondary analysis within a systematic review that is synthesizing and assessing the effectiveness of parent-mediated participation interventions. Using the PRISMA P guidelines for systematic reviews, we are searching the following databases for peer-reviewed studies that are randomized or non-randomized with five or more participants, include children ages 2 to 19 with physical disabilities, have an explicit aim to promote participation, and are mediated by a parent. Our plan for analysis is to conduct a qualitative narrative synthesis or meta-analyses if appropriate. We will be extracting outcomes related to psychological well-being, including but not limited to quality of life, achievement of individualized participation goals, and program satisfaction or enjoyment. We are currently in the process of screening the studies, but we anticipate seeing an overall positive impact on child psychological well-being. Moving forward, our next steps will be to use the findings from this review to inform well-being outcome selection for a pilot feasibility study for promoting participation. This research is relevant to children and families here at Holland Blurview because it will help improve the current understanding of participation promoting interventions and their impact on the well-being of children with physical disabilities as well as provide an avenue for more effective interventions. If you're interested in learning more about my research, please come visit me at poster number five.
Wow, such diverse topics uh, by our first group of students. Really well done. We're now going to move on to the live Q&A portion. Uh, will the first judge pose a question to Margaret? Uh, Margaret, thank you very much for sharing the results of your research. Um, given that temperament is an intrinsic or biological trait, are therapies available to temper the temperament to get better control of emotional regulation and a better outcome for our kids? Or is temperament mostly cast in stone and treatment moving forward would be coping strategies to help deal with it? Um, thanks for your question, Peter. Um, I would say that because temperament is mostly biologically based, um, that's something that's going to be consistent long term. Um, what we would be looking to do would be to implement effective uh, coping strategies for children with autism spectrum disorder themselves or that their parents can participate in, and then hopefully improve the experience um, of those parties and then, you know, decrease challenging behaviors or um, behavioral manifestations of possible associated emotional dysregulation. Thank you. Would uh, Samantha ask the next question? Thank you, Margaret. To Clarissa. Hi, Clarissa. Thanks for sharing uh, the results of your review. I'm wondering in your findings, were you able to differentiate built environment experiences for different populations, so such as different disabilities or inpatient versus outpatient? Mm -hmm. In our findings, both populations were represented, but in the studies, they didn't seem to differentiate between which were inpatient and which were relevant to different disabilities. They were more so grouped as a common experience. Uh, but to your point, that's a really good um, perspective that we might seek to further research because these different populations may have different built environment experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Clarissa. And uh, judge number three is Aman. Uh, would you pose your question to Katrina? Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Katrina, for a very exciting study. I appreciated its practicality and what it could mean for just a game-changing uh, process improvement and quality improvement for prosthetics. Um, I'm curious around, you spoke about the feedback from prosthetists. I'm curious um, how you evaluated the experience of the 3D printed prosthetics for the clients that you tested it with. And uh, if you did so, what general feedback you heard? Yeah, so uh, so far a lot of the feedback has been qualitative and um, how we've been doing it is we've actually had the chance to test the sockets on two clients. Uh, basically when they're coming in for their normal appointments, we have a 3D printed socket ready. And then that's how we've had the clinicians come in and then they're able to see how well the socket fits. Um, we've also had the clinicians go through their <clears throat> normal clinical assessment process. So they can take the socket, um, they're seeing through the clarity of the diagnostic socket, and then they're able to highlight any areas that uh, have extra pressures and need to be released a little bit. So then they can go back, heat it up, and then they're pushing these sockets out. And then the feedback that they've been giving us is that the um, 3D printed diagnostic sockets are reacting very similarly to um, the traditional method produced sockets. So um, it's been pretty good feedback so far. Thank you. Uh, Katrina, next is Harry, and uh, you can go ahead and ask Aaron a question. Hey, Aaron, great presentation. Um, I was hoping, if, I was wondering if you could walk me through a quick example of a project that would use this tool. I'm looking for kind of the inputs and the outputs and maybe some functions that the graphical units would actually perform. Sure. So uh, we've built a number of uh, test examples that uh, researchers can build off of. Uh, so one really useful thing that you'll actually hear later on is the uh, P300 speller. Uh, it's an algorithm that allows uh, children with communication disabilities to actually spell words and, and communicate. So um, what the researcher has to do is they can build the processing pipeline using our tool and then connect it um, we're, we're, that's actually something we explored uh, through our, our building process, uh, the best way to connect it to an existing uh, visual interface, but they can build the processing pipeline using our tool and then just connect it to an existing um, visual interface so it seamlessly integrates um, or it'll hopelessly, uh, it'll hopefully seamlessly uh, integrate into their existing uh, interface. 
Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Harry. I can testify it's a nice piece of software. Uh, next question is from uh, Dr. Timothy Ross to Taryn. Hey, Taryn. Uh, thanks so much for your great presentation. Um, such interesting research. Uh, I have a two-part question, kind of focused on getting more context because I'm just really curious about this. So first, can you tell us a bit about the types of effective parent-mediated interventions that you've come across in this research thus far? And secondly, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit on what findings you're starting to uncover um, or that you expect to uncover through this work um, as they relate to participation and psychosocial well-being. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, so some of what we're seeing so far is really to um, solution focused coaching, which is where the clinician um, works with the parent to sort of promote the child's strengths and work towards outcomes um, related to that. And some of the um, outcomes that we're seeing so far, like I mentioned, are related to quality of life, program satisfaction or enjoyment, um, um, and achievement of individualized goals. Um, so that's what we have so far, just based off of a preliminary search, but we are planning on um, possibly including other literature-informed outcomes based on what we find. Thank you. Now we're going to do a little quick quiz uh, on Kahoot. So Greg, uh, would you be able to share the screen with the first pin for the game? Awesome. So again, just uh, if you can type in uh, kahoot.it onto any browser, whether it's on your phone or your laptop, uh, and everyone can enter these codes uh, that are uh, showing here on the top here. So it's 426-3568. Okay, I think uh, we have critical mass. So why don't we start? The audience, you have 10 seconds to answer these questions or two questions. And the first person to answer correctly will receive a $10 Tim, Tim Hortons gift card. Okay, great. Congratulations. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Wait, one more question. I jumped the gun. Okay, well, congratulations to uh, P. Uh, P, if you want to claim your prize, please uh, send us your full name and your email address. Uh, you can direct message it towards Summer Student Research Day, uh, one of the co-hosts here for the event, and uh, we'll be in touch with you. Now we're going to uh, hear from the next group of student presentations, uh, followed by such an incredible round, a first round of presentations. Uh, the next students are uh, Malroy Solomon, Julia Yi, Devin Sheetfar, Shailen Su, and Megan Carroll. Hello, my name is Mallory, and today I'm going to be presenting the work that I have done for the last three months. 
So what is assistive technology? Assistive technology are either products, equipment, or systems that help enhance learning, working, and otherwise daily living for people with disabilities. These are meant to increase, maintain, and improve functional capabilities for people with disabilities. So an example of uh, assistive technology are mobility aids, hearing aids, um, also brain computer interface. So what is brain computer interfaces? Um, BCIs are systems that determine functional intent directly using brain activity. In other words, people can control their environment without moving, without having to need, like to, to without having to move their body, essentially. So what is missing? Well, an Indigenous perspective. Um, BCI advancements might not meet the unique needs of Indigenous communities, and an Indigenous perspective might help increase understanding of interpersonal syncrasy, so connections between people. Um, so we are going to do this by recruiting Indigenous people with lived experiences with disability, across Ontario. Um, there's going to be three groups, youth, adults, and knowledge keepers. So that would be elders, um, medicine person, spiritual healer. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to have them fill out a demographic survey and participate in sharing circle. The sharing circle will follow traditional protocol and questions will be provided ahead of time and they will be given a video to watch prior to the sharing circle. That would explain BCI technology and assistive technology. So we're going to do this by um, an inductive thematic contact analysis. The sharing circles will be recorded and notes will be taken. Recordings will be transcribed and the reveals will search for and identify common themes. The themes will be then presented to the participants through another set of sharing circles. Uh, the stories from the participants will help build a strong foundation to an Indigenous framework with regards to BCI technology, hearing from families and those with lived experiences with regards to disabilities will be used to inform further development and to ensure that Indigenous voices are heard and not left out within these important conversations and development. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julia. This project focuses on examining the effect of age on neuroimaging measures in children with and without neurodevelopmental conditions. Neuroimaging data has been commonly used in research related to neurodevelopmental conditions. Among those studies, there are established effects of age on brain measures. As of now, these age effects are corrected in most research. However, effects may differ between independently collected data sets. This challenges the replicability and generalizability of the findings. So the research question is, do age effects on measures of brain function differ across two data sets, namely PON and HBN? We used fMRI data from both data sets. These two data sets cover children with ADHD, ASD, OCD, and typical development pre-processed and corrected functional connectomes of 232 brain regions were derived. To analyze the age-related effects, normative modeling was implemented to construct sex and data set specific trajectories and deviation scores. Deviation scores are then compared between data sets by training normative model on one data set and testing for the other one. We have found significant differences in deviation scores. When the HBM model is used as a training model, deviations in the PON data sets are the largest in connections involving subcortical regions. When the PON model is used as the training model, deviations in the HBN data sets are the largest in non subcortical networks. These dots represent specific regions of the brain. The letter acronyms represent specific brain networks. For example, LIM stands for Limbic System Network. The red lines represent a large effect size of a connection between the two nodes. As this is a long-term project, I'll be working with Marley and Professor Kuski until the end of August. We hope to identify the effect of age correction methods on the findings and apply normative modeling in structural connectum. We believe that this project can help to understand uh, the age effects in different data sets and improve replicability and generalizability of research findings. Please join me at poster number seven to learn more. 
and thank you for watching. The incidence of speech impairments in children with cerebral palsy, stroke, traumatic brain injury, and the various neurodevelopmental disorders that we support at home Blurview ranges as high as 76%. Understanding the brain mechanisms that drive speech learning can inform our understanding of how to best care for children with speech impairments. One means of understanding how the brain controls speech is via auditory perturbation experiments. These experiments involve changing the audio response that someone receives in a speech task. For example, if a participant says bed, the word they may hear in a noise canceling headphone could be the word bad, where the word they hear is altered just slightly from the word they say. The data from these experiments can be tedious and difficult to analyze, costing researchers time and effort. We identified a need for a fast, easy, and customizable software that analyzes audio data quickly and seamlessly. We started by scanning relevant publications to investigate how common data analysis techniques were conducted, which helped us identify the features the software would need to accommodate a wide range of studies. The software was developed in both MATLAB and R. MATLAB is a common programming language used in engineering and data analysis, and R is a common programming language used in statistical analysis. To supplement the software, a configuration file was created that allows researchers to change the settings of the software to fit their experiment. These results are an example of an output you might expect from a participant. There are participant graphs, which are essential for understanding their audio responses. There is also an information text file, which contains vital information about the participant and details about the analysis process. For example, the number of outliers that may have been removed. And it performs a mixed ANOVA, which is a common statistical analysis technique. This is an added feature for researchers whose setup falls under a facilitatory, control, and inhibitory paradigm. Also, for future researchers to understand how to use the software and its limitations, we created a manual that requires no prior knowledge of the software and no communication with us to use. This software is currently being used in an ongoing study with the Connect Lab in the preliminary stages. For researchers outside of home Blurview, the software will be shared through a commonly used code sharing application, GitLab. Overall, this software is meant to improve access and ease of use for running and analyzing outcomes of auditory perturbation experiments, which may result in wider uptake of this tool for understanding how the brain controls speech. This will ultimately inform treatment design and outcome measures in the future for children at home Blurview. Thank you, and please find me at poster number eight for questions. Hi, my name is Shaylin, and I'll be presenting my project on discovering autistic youth and young adults' experiences of workplace disclosure. Robert is a young autistic adult starting his first job at the grocery store. He feels he may need some accommodations, like a chair, as it's hard for him to stand for long periods, or to keep his phone on him to help time manage his shift, which makes him think about whether and how to disclose his autism. Deciding to disclose one's autism at work is a complex process. Current research focuses on autistic adults, and little is known about disclosure experiences of autistic youth and young adults as they transition to employment. Which brings us to question, what are the experiences of autistic youth and young adults when deciding whether and how to disclose their autism at work, and what influences their decisions? To address this, we conducted six virtual focus groups with 23 autistic youth and young adults. Data analysis was led by PhD candidate Vanessa and I by using an inductive thematic analysis to develop codes and key themes. We collaboratively developed the coding framework, independently coded the transcripts, calculated intercoder reliability, and met to discuss and resolve any discrepancies in codes. We developed six overarching themes discussing influencers of the disclosure process, weighing benefits and risks, external factors, experiences of autism, disclosure roadmap, contingent supports, and the game plan. Overall, these themes revealed several individualized factors which influenced the disclosure process, with external factors such as the workplace environment, culture, and people being the greatest influencer. These findings shed light on the lived experiences of autistic youth and young adults, especially the challenges they may face when disclosing, and the individualized nature of this process. The study also emphasizes that disclosure experiences are context dependent in which future research should prioritize and understand the impact of these external factors during the disclosure process. These findings offer Holland Borview clinicians the knowledge to develop employment tools and programs which support disclosure decision making processes and are tailored to the individual needs of each autistic client, just like Robert. Thank you for listening and you can visit me at poster number nine for more information. 
Hello, my name is Megan, and today I will be presenting my work on the performance optimization of a brain-computer interface communication system for children with disabilities. Brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, are systems that decode brain activity and translate it into external commands. A specific application of a BCI is the P300 speller. This system allows users to communicate by presenting them with a grid of characters that flash in a random sequence. The user can visually focus on their desired character and when it is flashed, this will trigger a distinct brain activity known as the P300 response. This allows the BCI to distinguish between target and non-target stimuli. My work throughout the summer aimed to optimize a P300 speller through the flash sequence to determine whether it could be an effective form of communication for children with disabilities. To do this, I developed a flash sequence algorithm that optimized the P300 speller by eliminating all occurrences of adjacent and double flashes. These events can cause distractions and reduce the size of the P300 response, resulting in the wrong button being chosen. The new flash sequence algorithm was compared to the previous method, which was just random flash group selection. As you can see, the new algorithm was successful in completely eliminating all double and adjacent flashes. For smaller grid sizes, the flash sequence algorithm did not significantly reduce the amount of time that it took for each button to be uniquely identifiable. However, this time difference did become slightly more significant for larger grid sizes. The largest time difference measured was 1.1 seconds for a 57 button grid. Some next steps for this study include recruiting participants between the ages of 8 to 19 with disabilities who can test the communication system. Another next step would be to research and develop tactile and auditory P300 systems for individuals with visual impairments. The knowledge gained from this study is relevant to Hall and Blurview because a P300 speller could provide an alternative form of communication for individuals who have not yet found a method that works for them. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or want to learn more, please come visit me at poster number 10. Well, another set of riveting presentations. Congrats to all of our students. Let's move on to the Q&A. Uh, Christine, with first question to Mallory. Hi, Mallory. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I'm really excited about the opportunity for your work to inform um, an Indigenous framework for BCI technology. My question to you is, if we think ahead about this framework, who would you share this framework with and what would you tell them about the framework? I would share this framework with like indigenous communities and like informing, I guess like, uh, especially like uh, to other healthcare professionals and, you know, just to be informed about like an indigenous perspective because I find a lot of the healthcare research forgets to include that perspective and that we have uh, as indigenous communities have very unique needs so it's important to give it back to the community as well as inform like uh, healthcare practitioners and people in academia but yeah that's my answer thank you so much Thank you, Christine and Mallory. Uh, Jennifer Rose is the next judge, but she was not able to attend. She's a family leader. So Julia, I'm going to read uh, Jennifer's question to you. Uh, her question is, uh, once you complete your project on age-related effects in uh, neurodevelopmental conditions amongst different data sets, what project or research question would you have next? In other words, what would be your next project? Um, so I guess, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the question. And then thank you, Tom, for reading the question out loud. Um, our next step would be uh, doing the normative modeling on DTI data as well. And then we also, right now we know that there is like a age-related effects between the data sets. Now we want to identify what those age correction techniques, uh, kind of what, what the age correction techniques have on those uh, studies that that is being done in the academia. Thank you, Julia. 
Next up, we have um, Shauna asking a question to Devin. Hi, Devin. Uh, thank you for sharing this work to fill a gap with um, specialized software. Can you speak to some of your ideas to test the software and manual? I'm particularly curious about any plans for end user engagement, as well as the desired outcomes that you spoke to around saving time and, uh, and effort. <clears throat> That's a great question, because I've been thinking about that. Um, basically, to test the software and whether or not it's reliable so far all we've done was so basically like if you say a word you have an expected output you keep saying that same word you're going to expect the same output so we've just been doing that with like different words and seeing if that is what happens um and then also a past thesis um a past phd student in this lab actually uh in her thesis she said she used um this database that has actual like pre given values and you can run them through it and then you could find it out. So that hasn't been done yet, but um, I am planning on doing that in the near future. Um, and then just general outcomes. Um, we're, I'm currently using it like with a current master's student. And so we're just seeing kind of how it works with pilot data and with um, you know participants just within even our lab or other ward students. Great, great, thank you. Thanks, Devin, thanks, Shana. Uh, Dolly will now ask a question to Shaylin. Thank you, Tom. Shaylin, thank you for that wonderful presentation, your quick hit. Um, my question for you today is, can you tell us a bit about the facilitation methods that you used in your focus groups to discover your participants' experiences and which ones were the most successful? Definitely. So thank you, Dolly, for your uh, presentation. So um, I actually wasn't part of um, facilitating the interviews during this stage of the focus group, but based off of the um, semi-structured uh, interview guide that my PhD um, colleague um, uh, developed in coordination um, with our supervisor, um, there were certain questions that um, were that uh, she developed in order to prompt the experiences. So for example, um, in order to um, discover some of the experience, individualized experience of these individuals disclosure process, um, we asked them what sort of jobs they have done in the past and what sort of strategies they have used um, in those jobs in order to um, disclose or non-disclose. Thank you. Thanks, Dolly and Shailen. Uh, Robin, I invite you to ask a question to Megan. Great presentation, Megan. Uh, really great to hear about the work you've been doing this summer and this new flash algorithm that you had created. Um, although not statistically significant uh, in your presentation, why do you think eliminating the adjacent and double flashes improved the time for button identification for the larger grid sizes more so than the smaller ones? Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, the original method was just random selection and we had it so that all of the buttons would be flashed um, once before anything was flashed again. And this resulted in like the last flash, sometimes having less buttons in that group than some of the other ones. So I think a big part of that is that it, the way I've made it is that it'll add those in so that all of the flashes have the same amount of buttons. So um, you can go through it a little bit faster. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Robin and Megan. And now, Greg, let's uh, put up the next Kahoot. So everybody, please get ready. So the game pin is Okay, here we go.
Congratulations. The winner for this round is Jay. So Jay, if you um, message whoever uh, Manny sent the message to claim your prize. This is a bit unfair because I had two questions from my own lab and I, I got beaten answering them. So this is uh, hopeless for people like me. Well, congratulations to uh, the audience, your enthusiastic participation. So, very impressive. Well, Tom, uh, I think we're both really impressed with all the research presentations so far. What do you think of today? Um, well, one, one uh, quote comes to mind from the late Cambridge professor, Favillian, which is, uh, never tell a young person that anything can't be done. It's just uh, phenomenal, the amount of work that's been done in three months. Uh, really impressive, really impressive. So I understand we have enough time to, to take a five minute break at this point. So uh, we'll reconvene in five minutes so everybody can um, have a chance to walk away from the monitor for a short break. Okay, see you soon. So welcome back everyone. We're now going to move on to the next uh, round of student presentations. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the following students, Brianna Wedderburn, Emily Eng, Sophia Varen, and Hannah McLean. Starting at birth, humans have an intrinsic need to be social. We seek out faces and learn what it means to connect with others in diverse and personally meaningful ways. In fact, social connections are so important to an individual's well-being that they have been designated as a determinant of health. Despite us all having this need, children and youth with disabilities tend to experience higher levels of social exclusion and less reciprocal friendships than their peers living without disability. This means less opportunities to make friends and a higher risk for negative health outcomes. Knowing this, it is imperative that friendship development is a primary goal when designing programs. We must ensure that opportunities for meaningful, holistic, and accessible interactions with peers are available. This is where the arts come in. This summer, we embarked on a scoping review of five databases, asking the question, how does arts-based programming foster the foundations for friendship for children and youth with disabilities? Using search terms such as arts-based programming, disability, and friendship, we initially came across 13,994 studies, 159 of which moved on to the full text review process. Although this research is ongoing, we have identified five studies so far that meet all our criteria. So here's what we're learning. During our initial search of the literature on friendships, we identified three essential needs foundational to friendship development. First, we have needs for the self. For this aspect, children and youth may ask, who am I? What do I enjoy? And what can I offer in a friendship? Research shows that opportunities for self-expression through the arts can help children and youth develop a sense of self essential to healthy relationships. Next, we have needs from others. Children and youth may ask, is this a space where I am accepted by my leaders and peers? Do I get to spend time meaningfully with others? Research shows that the arts provide opportunities to connect meaningfully without barriers. Lastly, we have needs from the environment. Children and youth may ask, am I able to access the space where my program is? Is a program when I can participate in meaningfully? Research shows that the arts can be easily adapted and relocated to meet a child's individual needs. In conclusion, by implementing the arts into programming, we can reduce the risk of isolation and poor health comes children and youth with disabilities face. Art works for any child, in any space, in any way they wish to engage. By doing as much as we can to provide opportunities for friendships, we can holistically meet the needs of our clients and provide opportunities that will influence overall health. If you would like to learn more about how the arts promote friendship, feel free to stop by at poster number 11. Thank you. One of the most incredible skills that develops during childhood is speech. Speech allows children to express their needs and emotions and connect with those around them. As children acquire speech, it is important that they hear themselves speaking. Auditory feedback from our own voices can be used to detect speech errors and modify future speech productions. This process is called speech motor adaptation, and it is an integral part of speech acquisition and maintenance across development. Our study aims to investigate the neural mechanisms underlying this complex process. Previous studies have suggested the importance of the left ventral premotor cortex and speech adaptation, but the relationship between the two is not well understood, indicating a need for further exploration. 
Participants in our study will receive repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation of the left ventral premotor cortex prior to a speech motor adaptation task. Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS, is a type of non-invasive brain stimulation that can regulate the activity of neurons in a target area. Participants will be randomly assigned to receive one type of RTMS, facilitatory, inhibitory, or sham. To put it simply, facilitatory RTMS makes neurons more responsive, inhibitory RTMS makes neurons less responsive, and sham is similar to a placebo where no real stimulation is delivered. In the speech adaptation task, participants will repeat single words while their auditory feedback is altered through headphones. This means that what they're saying and what they're hearing no longer match. Typically, participants shift their speech production in the opposite direction of the alteration as a compensatory response. We will use mixed ANOVAs to compare participants' performance in the speech adaptation task across the three RTMS conditions. If the left ventral premotor cortex is critical to speech adaptation, we expect to see an increased adaptation response in the facilitatory group compared to baseline. In the inhibitory group, we expect to see a decreased adaptation response to baseline. And finally, in the sham group, we do not expect to see a significant difference in adaptation compared to baseline. Technical testing has been conducted to ensure feasibility of the experimental protocol, and we are now ready to run the experiment on participants. Results from our study will contribute to our understanding of the neural basis of speech adaptation and the complex process of childhood speech acquisition. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, please come visit me at poster number 13. Hi, I'm Sophia Veron, and my project is Brain State Dependent Brain Stimulation, a review of the current implementations and preliminary interpretations from the electroencephalography of youth. Brain state dependent brain stimulation, or BSDVS, is a way of stimulating the brain to do something based on the brain's activity. How they work is BSDVS systems record ongoing brain activity, and once a target signal or behavior is detected, the BSDVS system stimulates the brain to perform a desired task or to deliver treatment. BSDVS is used in a variety of clinical settings, one of which is motor rehabilitation in adults. In this setting, the brain activity of interest is motor imagery, which is the process in which a person imagines that they're performing a movement. Notably, BSTVS has not yet been used for motor rehabilitation in children, and an obstacle to its development is that motor imagery is not reliable in children. As a result, the goal of this project is to combine current BSDVS techniques with motor observation instead of motor imagery in order to develop a BSDVS system that is suitable for motor rehabilitation in children. To do this, I began by participating in a review of 102 studies using different forms of BSDVS to identify current techniques and trends. I compared common stimulation locations, different implementations, and the clinical settings in which they were used. Next, we conducted a study with electroencephalography, also known as EEG. Using EEG, we recorded the brain activity of participants with upper limb weakness or paralysis as they watched or executed a hand squeezing motion to determine the relationship between motor observation and execution. I contacted 153 clients with cerebral palsy and upper limb paralysis, of which six enrolled in this study. Data analysis for the EEG study is ongoing, but the results will allow us to identify a brain signal that shows similar activity during movement execution and observation. The next steps are to use this signal to develop a brain-computer interface that triggers brain stimulation once it detects motor observation, which will trigger a grasping motion in individuals with upper limb paralysis. The outcomes and future directions of the study can impact clients at Holland Bloorview through informing the development of a new avenue for rehabilitation for children with upper limb weakness or paralysis. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Hannah. I will be sharing the work I've been doing with my amazing colleagues in the Pearl Lab to create an accessible and engaging music education curriculum. Music making is an important part of education for children across Canada, and it can have a positive impact on self-efficacy, cognitive, and social skills. Children with disabilities are less likely to participate in early childhood music education due to a range of barriers, including but not limited to a lack of suitable programs, high cost, the scheduling difficulties, and lack of accessible programming. A virtual medium, such as an app, could help to alleviate some of these barriers. In designing a virtual music teacher app, it is important to consider the learning goals and to provide content that engages kids in active, meaningful, engaged, and socially interactive learning for best outcomes. 
Our goal is to create and evaluate a music education curriculum for our virtual music teacher, VMT app, that incorporates learning goals from across the Canadian provincial curriculums while providing supports and adaptations that kids with disabilities need to participate in music learning. We conducted a systematic review of Canadian provincial curriculums, grades K to three, for early childhood music education that involved extracting learning goals, suggested activities and prompts for educators to deploy in their classrooms from each provincial curriculum. This review yielded 1,009 activities and prompts associated with learning outcomes. We applied thematic analysis to group related learning goals into similar categories represented by a curriculum mind map, as shown here, that identifies eight curriculum categories, which can be described in terms of three focused areas. Number one, musical building blocks, which focus on rhythm and beat, pitch and melody, timbre and notation. Number two, music creation and performance, including creative composition, musical performance, and production skills. And number three, human experience of music, which covers topics like music in itself, contextualizing music, and cultural practices around music making. The findings in our systematic review and thematic analysis suggest that Canadian children with disabilities lack the necessary supports to participate fully in music education alongside their typically developing peers. Of particular importance is the need for music education curriculums to provide more access pathways uh, for students for kids with physical and cognitive disabilities. The VMT project aims to address these accessibility gaps and support broad access to musical skill development in a fun and engaging manner. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, you can find me in the breakout room for poster number 15. Great, thank you. Fascinating presentations. I'd like to invite our judges now to ask questions. Uh, first one will be Peter and uh, Brianna. Uh, Brianna, thank you very much for sharing your research on this. Um, you say disability can lead to less opportunities to make friends. How can it be handled when there's an impaired ability to make social connections, i.e. autism or physiological communication difficulty, even when the opportunity is provided? So that's one of the things that we actually looked at with our research and um, with the arts, it's great because it's very flexible. Um, when you're engaging with the arts, it's not necessarily that if you're communicating with others that you have to communicate through speech or traditional ways of communication. You can also express yourself visually. You can express yourself through your actions. Um, you can express yourself just like in a different way than we would traditionally expect. And so that's one of the major benefits of engaging with the arts. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, Emily, I like, uh, sorry, Lauren, um, invite you to ask a question to Emily. Wonderful presentation, Emily. It was really very engaging. Um, my question is, should the results of your upcoming experiment um, turn out the way that you would hypothesize? Um, what might the results teach you about speech acquisition in clients with disabilities such that those like those we service um, clinically at Holland Bloorview? Thank you for your question, Lauren. Um, yeah, so if basically if the results show what we hypothesize, and that would mean that the left ventral premolar cortex is critical to speech adaptation and um, that TMS, RTMS specifically facilitatory can help increase that. And so I think um, next steps would probably be um, running this experiment um, in regards to children with specific disabilities um, that would affect their ability to adapt to um, auditory feedback perturbations. Um, so yeah, there would have to be a lot more research done, I think, in order to see the implications on disability research. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, Trina, I invite you to ask a question to uh, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Um, great job on your presentation. Um, so you said that uh, children in children, you're hoping to use motor observation as opposed to motor imagery. So I was just wondering if you could tell us maybe some of the potential benefits in terms of accessibility uh, with motor observation in children as opposed to motor imagery, and then also comment on maybe the differences and similarities in brain activation or success um, using motor observation that you hope to see in your research or maybe that you learned about in the literature review part. Yeah, for sure. So um, one of the main advantages of motor um, observation is that um, it uses something called motor neuron, I mean, it mo mirror neurons. So these neurons basically activate when you see someone doing a specific task. 
Um, and a big benefit of this is that um, these neurons, I think, um, the development of or the comparison between motor imagery and motor observation um, was developed before I joined the project, so I'm not 100% clear on the exact distinctions. Um, but one of the major um, benefits to motor observation is that it develops earlier than motor imagery, and so it's a more reliable measure in the sense that if there are children who have, uh, for example, uh, delays in cognitive development, um, this can be used for them instead of um, asking them to engage in motor imagery, which requires them to imagine performing the movement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Trina. Uh, next question is for Hannah and Masuma, who is one of the judges, was not able to attend. So I will read the question. Um, have you designed or created the user interface layout for your virtual music therapy app? Um, um, and how, how, how will the uh, intervention be presented to children? Okay, so um, <clears throat> personally, I have not designed the musical layout app, but um, I have not, but I have actually reviewed it and I have, uh, I have listed the accessibility concerns in a separate document with each mini game prototype that we have. And sorry, could you repeat the second part of your question? Oh, how, how would the music intervention be presented to children? Well, the music intervention would probably be, okay, so we are trying to go over each um, app in a different way. We have like a little mini games for each uh, curriculum category that is listed. And uh, we are trying to achieve a balance between uh, how to make it accessible enough and how to, while effectively conveying each topic in a meaningful way that the kids will enjoy. Hey, thank you, Hannah. So now it's time for the Kahoot quiz for this group of presentations. Greg, can you share the game? So 513106. Okay, here we go. Well, I tried really hard. Derek, good job, Derek. Leslie. I can't believe I was fast enough to get the ring. Gina. Wow, congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, so, um, I, uh, Manny, over to you. Okay, great. Congrats again, Trina, and uh, wonderful presentation so far. 
I have the real pleasure now to introduce you to our uh, final group of students presenting today. Uh, Paige Franz, uh, Grace Resnick, Yasmin Elliott, Nicholas Barkhaus, and Anusha Rokhaus. There are currently no recommendations or best practices for promoting participation of individuals from equity deserving groups in autism research. Autism research grossly lacks diversity especially regarding Indigenous communities, racialized individuals, women due to the less common nature of an ASD diagnosis among females, as well as high needs individuals. Using a rapid view, review approach and following Cochrane collaboration guidelines, OVID databases, Medline, Embase, and APA Psych Info were searched using keywords related to underrepresentation, minority, research, and recruitment, and inclusion exclusion criterion to identify studies re reporting determinants of participants for equity driven groups was applied and articles were reviewed by two independent reviewers. We however encountered dissimilarities regarding the scope of extracted articles, inconsistent studies designs made for a less focused research lens. A revised search paradigm was facilitated to focus primarily on more definitive approaches to research recruitment, including diversity strategies. This comprehensive search included racialized uh, group terms that did not exclude groups outside of Canada, including Black, Indigenous and Aboriginal, person of color, Latin, ethnic, race, marginalized and Hispanic. Proposed in figure one, the PRISMA diagrams outline the literature search conducted for A, the initial search, and B, the revised search that would follow. Success was found in the revised search in terms of article relevance to strategies and study methods that could be qualitatively compared against others. This revised literature search brought forth interesting patterns. One, there was a lack of studies that report on definitive action to increase the recruitment of racialized diverse groups. And two, some factors that may contribute to underrepresentation of equity deserving groups may include A, interest in research participation among caregivers of children with ASD, as well as B, training of recruiters and research staff to include high needs neurodevelopmental individuals in the research paradigms. A rapid review publication will be completed during the next steps. With a heightened focus on strategies to promote more representative ASD research, this publication will aid in providing a blueprint for Holland Blore Review to formulate study methodologies to better accommodate ASD individuals and provide multi-domain care. This research can help form strategies to increase participation of individuals from equity deserving groups in research, all the while propelling Holland Blore Review forward towards a more inclusive and therefore beneficial research direction. Healthcare equity comes when research participants reflect the diversity of our culture. Thank you so much for listening. Feel free to join me at Poster 16. Hi, I'm Grace, and I'm going to be presenting my project, Correlating Features from a Tracing Task to Social Responsiveness Scores in Children with Autism. Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD, manifests in diverse ways, making it challenging to create tools which can help identify ASD, especially in childhood. To be diagnosed with ASD, children must meet criteria set out by the DSM-5, which includes social communication and interaction differences. Interestingly, studies also show high rates of comorbid motor difficulties in children with autism, such as in drawing tasks. Perhaps these drawing difficulties can be seen in a tracing task, which could then be used as a potential simple tool to help identify ASD. But there lacks an investigation of how these drawing difficulties in autism manifest in tracing tasks, and if these difficulties can be correlated to the characteristic social differences. So we wanted to know, in children with ASD, can features measured from their tracings completed during a collaborative drawing game show significant correlations to their social responsiveness? We measured 720 drawings from children and their parents who trace together on a tablet, 30 children with ASD and 15 typically developing children. We then collected responses to the SRS questionnaire, which is a measure of social responsiveness. Then I created a list of 27 static and dynamic drawing features based on drawing analyses in the literature and used MATLAB to measure these features in the drawings. Finally, I performed a linear regression between these drawing features and the SRS scores. On the left here are some examples of the lion trace processed in MATLAB, and in the middle is an example of the linear regression. As you can see in this example, as the SRS score of social responsiveness severity increases, the average distance from trace also increases. From this preliminary analysis on 50 drawings, we found eight measures that show significant correlations to SRS scores, including average distance from trace, total stroke distance, and mean acceleration. As the next steps, more drawings and a more refined linear regression model are needed. This study helps expand the knowledge of how autism manifests and demonstrates a potential simple tool to help identify 
autism in childhood. With more ways to indicate autism, more children may have the opportunity to be diagnosed and access essential services. Thank you for listening and please come check out my poster number 17. Hello everyone, my name is Yasmin Elliott and this summer I've been working on a review looking at the properties of validated child and youth self-report measures of engagement. Before we begin, imagine this. There's a fantastic new pediatric rehabilitation treatment that a service provider is using with a client, but the client's skeptical about the treatment and as a result is not fully invested in the process. Understandably, regardless of the treatment's efficacy, the client's lack of investment in the intervention would lead to less favorable outcomes. This scenario highlights the importance of engagement. Engagement refers to the multifaceted state of motivation that clients feel towards their role throughout the treatment process. Engagement encompasses the affective, cognitive, and behavioral aspects of the client's role. And importantly, we know that client engagement is critical in pediatric rehabilitation, given that it facilitates effective treatment delivery and outcome, adherence and goal achievement, and family-centered care. And so given its importance, it's critical that we have ways to measure client engagement. Correspondingly, the PRIME team at Holland Bloorview is working to develop the PRIME-C tool as a part of a larger research project capturing children and adolescents' perspectives of their treatment engagement. Self-report measures designed for children and youth, however, require unique considerations to ensure that they're both user-friendly and developmentally appropriate. That brings us to the purpose of the present review, which had three main objectives. The first being to identify validated child and youth self-report measures, to assess the clinical utility of these measures, and then provide recommendations to inform the development of the PRIME-C. Our main research question, therefore, was what were the clinometric properties of validated child and youth self-report measures of engagement that make them clinically useful? To answer our main question, we conducted an integrative review where we first identified keywords associated with our two main concepts. We then searched five medical and social science databases. Five independent reviewers then screened the titles and abstracts of these retrieved articles based on a predetermined criteria. The full text of the articles that made it through the initial screening were then reviewed to identify the validated measures reported in each. And then the measures that met our inclusion criteria were then assessed using the CAN Child Outcome Measures Rating Form Guidelines. Our preliminary results suggest that there are many self-report measures that are designed for use with children and youth that utilize features like pictorial scales, simplified vocabulary, and tailored response options, all to enhance usability and comprehension. Based on what we're learning about the features of these effective measures, we're formulating recommendations for the PRIME-C. The PRIME-C will be useful for, for clinicians, researchers, and Holland Blue Review clients to allow for the continuous monitoring and assessment of treatment engagement, potentially improving treatment outcomes. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any additional questions, you can see me at poster 18. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicholas. And today I'll discuss some of the work that I completed for my summer project at the Autism Research Center. Autism spectrum disorder is associated with differences in emotional regulation and increased likelihood of anxiety. These difficulties can decrease participation in life activities, school, and can impact long-term outcomes, such as mental health. Autism can also be associated with differences in sensory processing. Although previous studies have demonstrated an association between these differences and elevated levels of anxiety and emotional dysregulation in various psychiatric disorders, these associations remain largely unknown in autism. To address this gap, the main objective of this study is to examine the associations among sensory differences, emotional regulation, and anxiety in children with ASD. We used data from 119 children between the ages of seven and 16. For each participant, we collected a sensory profile using the short sensory profile questionnaire, anxiety symptoms using the screen for childhood anxiety disorders, and emotional regulation difficulties using the emotional dysregulation inventory. Using this data, I conducted correlation analyses to characterize associations between sensory differences, emotional regulation, and anxiety. As you can see in the left and middle figures, our preliminary results show that higher sensory differences, such as a lower score on the SSP, were associated with increased emotional dysregulation. In addition, you can see in the rightmost figure the higher levels of sensory differences were associated with increased anxiety. This may be related to increased aversive experiences for children with sensory differences. These results suggest that differences in sensory processing are associated with anxiety and emotional regulation. The results of the study may inform how supports and accommodations can be designed with sensory differences in mind. Future studies are needed to further understand the mechanisms that contribute to the associations between sensory differences, emotional dysregulation, and anxiety. Thank you for listening to my presentation. 
If you have any questions, please feel to reach me at my poster station. I look forward to seeing you. Music is a universal language that connects us all. Plato once said that music is a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. My name is Anusha, and today I will be sharing my project about a brain-controlled piano keyboard for children with severe motor impairments. To control a piano with your brain, a brain-computer interface, or BCI, is needed. BCIs are assistive technologies that convert brain signals into commands to enable those with various disabilities to interact with their environment. Children with severe motor impairments due to neurological conditions such as cerebral palsy or stroke are not able to play normal musical instruments with their hands. However, a special brain signal called the P300 can actually be used to help children play music with only their mind. As many of us know, playing music has many neurological benefits, but there are very few opportunities for children with motor impairments to participate in musical activities. To fill this gap, I developed a BCI piano keyboard interface to investigate if it can produce a robust P300 brain signal in users so that they can play the piano without using their hands. So the interface has three modes. Once the user has selected a song in the song choice mode, a series of images will flash on the piano keys in a randomized sequence. To play a note, the user must look at the piano key that matches the note in the bar on top. The notes will disappear as the user plays them. When the image flashes on the correct note, a P300 signal will be generated in the brain, detected by an EEG, and then a classifier will tell the interface to play the sound of that note. In pilot testing, a robust P300 signal was recorded while the piano keyboard was in use. These results are important because they indicate that children with motor impairments can use this interface to play the piano. Next steps of this project include using the interface as a rehabilitation tool by conducting musical therapy sessions for children with motor impairments and subsequently evaluating structural and functional changes in the brain with an MRI. In conclusion, this piano keyboard interface will allow children with severe motor impairments to be included in musical activities and experience the joy of playing music, all while exercising their brains throughout the process of rehabilitation. Please visit poster number 20 if you would like to learn more or see a demonstration. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for, uh, for your wonderful presentations today. I think we're so impressed with the amount of research that you've actually been able to undertake in such a short amount of time. It's only been uh, 12 weeks, I think, we've been together. Uh, I would now like to invite some of the judges uh, to ask uh, each student their question. I'm going to start with Diana. Will you uh, ask your question to Paige, please? Hi, Paige. Uh, great presentation. And thank you for taking an initiative and contributing to the efforts to include the group of children with autism who are often excluded from research. Uh, my question is, I'm just wondering if you can suggest one or two strategies uh, that researchers can use to be more inclusive. Yeah, thank you so much for your question, Diane. I think um, for me, one of two uh, results that we came up with was being able to better direct and teach researchers how to better accommodate uh, caregivers when it comes to children with ASD. So caregivers are better knowledgeable about how to better accommodate their students and um, children with ASD, as well as better train the recruiters and research staff. That becomes whether or not um, they can better accommodate those that are verbal, um, those that are higher functioning. And um, one, one of the things that we actually want to continue looking into is all the different means, uh, different categories of autism and better specify exactly which children with autism are most underrepresented represented so we will continue that with our search thank you that's great thank you thank you Paige thank you Diana uh, Amar I'm gonna call on you next to ask your question to Grace hi Grace thank you for your very interesting and I think provocative uh, research and findings um, I have a two-part question. First, I'm wondering um, how you landed on a tracing task and maybe this particular tracing task as the means to test for motor function. And more longer term, picking up from where you landed in your findings, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you see as the potential benefits and potential limitations of building out this activity to form one day an independent diagnostic tool or to be maybe embedded in existing di diagnostic tools like the DSM-5. 
Thank you for the question. Um, so I was not actually part of the project when they chose to do this specific tracing task, but from my understanding is that currently in the literature, there has been some preliminary um, tasks with autism where they draw just like a simple circle. Um, but this is limited in what you can see from just drawing a circle. Like there's not a lot of measures that you can measure from that. So I think this tracing task is a more complex task. It's also more engaging for the kids. Um, and it also like allows, I guess, yeah, more features to be measured from the drawings. Um, and since they're drawing with their parent and trying to work together, this kind of task allows more collaboration instead of just drawing a simplified circle or something like that. And there is like a specific goal that they're trying to work towards, which is like the specific trace. Um, and then for the second part of your question, in the future, I think, personally, I think it would be far into the future, but um, one of the next steps is using a neural network model with potentially uh, and like putting in this drawing analysis into the neural network model, as well as other um, measures to kind of help indicate autism. But again, this is like looking at the motor impairments and to be diagnosed with autism, it's more the social impairments. So I think there needs to be more research on the connection between those two um, for it to be used as a diagnostic tool. But I think it could definitely be used as a tool to help indicate autism uh, with more variables as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you so much, Aman. Uh, next up, uh, Shannon, will you also ask your question to Yasmin? Hi, Yasmin. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so thanks so much. You nicely outlined strengths of some of the features noted from the current measures, um, but also say that they have had minimal uptake. Are you kind of noting or reporting any features or findings that might explain this minimal uptake to help in the design process of the Prime C? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Just to clarify, when you mean uptake, do you mean of the present Prime C measure? Or oh, no, because I know you're creating, but just measures that have been used in the past. Right. Yeah. So the thing is with these self-report measures for children and youth, there's the difficulty sometimes of making sure that they're understanding everything. And so sometimes we're finding that service providers are kind of almost gatekeeping the self-report measures. So they think that, oh, children, they're not capable of understanding and all of these things. So I think that could explain a lot of it. So designing these measures specifically that are helpful for the service provider as well as for the children or whoever is the respondent. I think that um, will help with this issue with this uptake in the measures and it will be more informative. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that was a great answer. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Yasmin and Shannon. Uh, Shauna, I'm going to you next with your question to Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your research. Pretty incredible to, uh, to work from data from over 100 participants. I was wondering if you could share with us um, some further background on this data set um, that the study drew from and any strengths or limitations related to it, particularly around its representativeness or other features. Thank you, Shauna. Um, yeah, so kind of the background with this was uh, we use patient records. Um, so questionnaires uh, done on short sensory profiles, emotional regulation, anxiety were actually done by the parents themselves. Um, and so using that data that I uh, did correlation analysis using that. So um, kind of using this data, um, it really gives us a better understanding of how sensory processing um, can as we saw, there are significant differences, um, statistically significant, that show anxiety and emotional regulation. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, essentially the parents did the questionnaires. Um, some could be, some results could be biased. Um, so perhaps, you know, um, there could be research done um, to understand kind of the correlation or causation into why sensory processing leads to anxiety and emotional regulation. So there might be clinical studies that could be performed and hopefully to gain a better understanding of how physicians, researchers can provide supports and accommodations for children with autism and other related disorders. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks so much, Shauna. Thanks so much, Nicholas, and all our presenters and our judges. Actually, if we can take the one step back, I, my apologies here. I missed Dolly asking a question to Anusha. So uh, last but not least. 
Thanks, Manny. Hi, Anusha. I'm so interested in your research over the past few weeks. I'm wondering, uh, you said that the next step would be to trial the app with uh, music therapy. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about either what you think the best study population would be to trial the app with next, or if not a study population, but directly trying it with kids who are participating in music therapy, what age range or interest level in music would be helpful? Yeah, thanks for your question. So the population we're looking at is children, perhaps with cerebral palsy or stroke or any neurological condition that um, would lead to a severe motor impairment that would en enable them, they wouldn't be able to use their hands to actually play an instrument. Um, and in this study, um, we expect um, children with severe motor impairments, we expect to see an increase in gray matter in the um, auditory and sensory regions of the brain um, because they can't use their hands. And, and in terms of more about the population, um, we would, these children would go to the music therapy sessions and they would play one of the songs that are listed. Um, they would have no background in music or any formal musical training at all. So this would probably be the first time that they would be playing the music, um, playing the piano with the therapist. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, now it's the real uh, time for our Kahoot quiz. So audience, hopefully you're ready. I see some people have already signed up. Uh, the game pin is 3415131. And as uh, people sign up here, we'll uh, get ready in a second. Okay, um, maybe we'll get started. Okay, great. Well, congratulations, Alexander. Uh, please reach out to us uh, by direct message here with your full name and email, and we will be happy to connect with you to give you your $10 to Morris gift card. And congratulations to all of the students who have presented their really insightful and interesting research today morning. Uh, I am going to turn it back to Tom now to say a few remarks before we go to the poster session. I was out by a thousand points on that last round, and I tried so hard. You know, one word for me is pathetic, but one word for the presentations is uh, rousing, captivating, galvanic, magnetic, and riveting. Congratulations to all our students. I'm thinking we should have a summer student program that runs all year long. Uh, thank you, Manny, and thank you to all the students. I'd like to invite everyone now to meet our students in their breakout rooms to chat with them more about their research. Uh, this is what you need to do to navigate to the different breakout rooms. 
on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a breakout room button. Okay. Uh, click on that button and you'll find a list of all the students with a join button, a blue button next to their names. Choose the room you'd like to enter and click join. If you want to leave the breakout room and join a different one, look for a blue button on the screen that says leave breakout room. This will enable you to select a different breakout room to chat with another student. Now, don't select leave meeting because that would take you out of the event. One minute before the poster sessions end, a countdown timer will appear in Zoom to notify you that there are 60 seconds left to wrap up your visit, and then you'll be automatically sent back to the main event. I encourage you to have uh, conversations with our students, and we'll see everyone back here for the award ceremony at 11.25. Thank you, everyone. So welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good opportunity to chat with our students. Uh, just looking back on what we heard this morning, I was really moved by the phenomenal impact on the field of childhood disability, uh, from the built environment to uh, social engagement and social connections, from 3D printing of sockets to BCIs of all stripes, from indigenous framework to sensory processing, from diversity in research to brain development and speech processing, from parent media interventions to disability disclosures, from anxiety in to, and uh, motoric manifestations in autism. Um, I think it's safe to say that nowhere else in the world is there this kind of concentration and intensity and breadth of research pertaining to childhood disability. Our scientists are truly pioneers. In many ways, they are defining the frontiers of their respective areas. The caliber of our scientists is truly unparalleled. The mentorship they provided our summer students is a reflection of their excellence. As such, there's so much to be hopeful for in the future. There's so much hope intrinsic to all that we heard today presented by our summer students. And I'm personally encouraged by all that has been accomplished this summer. And I want to share with you a, a brief quote from Kailash uh, Satyarthi, an Indian activist who champions for the right of education, right to education for young people. And I think it's very fitting uh, thinking about youth in terms of our summer students, but also the young people that we serve at home, Blur Blurview. And this is the quote, the power of youth is the commonwealth for the entire world. The faces of young people are the faces of our past our present, and our future. No segment in the society can match with the power, idealism, enthusiasm, and courage of young people. I'd like to personally thank and recognize each uh, summer student for their hard work, dedication over the past three months. And thank you for choosing Holland Blurview. Thank you to Margaret, Clarissa, Katrina, Aaron, Taryn, Mallory, Julia, Devin, Grace, Paige, Hannah, Sophia, Emily, Rayan, Megan, Shaylin, Yasmin, Nicholas, Anusha, and Brokaus. Oh, sorry, Anusha, Nicholas. I, oh, is it, oh, no, that's her last name, sorry. And Anusha. We're closing out our no boundary strategy at Hull and Blurview, and you've all reminded us of the standard and rigor of science befitting of a sans frontier approach to science. Congratulations to our 2022 Ward Summer Student class. It's now my pleasure to announce this year's uh, poster and oral presentation winners. The best poster research award goes to Katrina May. Congratulations, Katrina. Oh, we have two. Uh, best post awards. The second one goes to uh, Grace Resnick. Congratulations, Grace. And the best oral presentation is uh, Emily Ang. Congratulations, Emily. So a few uh, final acknowledgements. Uh, thank you, Manny, for co-hosting today. Uh, thank you to our judges for all your time in reviewing the research to, uh, 
conducted by our students and to many families who joined us this morning. I'd also like to acknowledge the BRI operations team for organizing this incredible event. You guys are simply amazing. A special thanks goes to Molly Kong, our events management student in coordinating the event, marketing materials, and getting the word out to everyone. For Greg Van Den Krunenberg, who always works his magic, to make sure AV standpoint, everything goes so smoothly, and Flora Wan for creating the breakout rooms. I want to give a big shout out to Jeannie Fong for all the behind the scenes work and endless hours she's put into making this event possible. Thank you. Thank you again to the Ward Family Foundation and the CIBC for your support. Thank you for making a real and meaningful impact on raising kids with disabilities. We hope you enjoyed the Ward Summer Student Research Day. Thank you for attending and participating. And uh, it, this is my uh, last uh, Ward Summer Student Day as VP of Research, so a bittersweet moment. And um, But like I said, I'm filled with so much hope for the future. I'd like to invite Manny, if you have any final thoughts you'd like to share at this point. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I, I really don't know what else I could say. It's always hard to follow Tom in any of our presentations, but uh, I was blown away by the amount of work that's gone in over the last 12 weeks. And of course, uh, you know, if you think about a hospital-based research institute, you think about the actual hospital itself and, our, and the people that we serve as our clients and families. But the work that you do is, is really beyond that. Um, and, and I saw evidence of that through things like the, the 3D printing, the digitally uh, uh, printed all prosthetics or the hospital experiences and how to support emotional regulation or employment and skills and participation in life. Really, it goes beyond uh, just the walls of our hospital, the, the, just the clients that we serve. It really is a global impact that you're trying to make. Uh, and I can't uh, be sort of more pleased with the amount of you know, engagement and, and the work that has gone in from our faculty and our from our researchers and graduate students. So really thank you for them uh, for leading the way here and uh, your maturity. I mean, the, the students here, I think back to my undergraduate days and I've actually had a conversation with one of our faculty not that long ago about the maturity and the, and the quality of the candidates that we're getting for our World Summer Student Program every year. And really it's, it's mind blowing uh, at the level of maturity and the level of problem solving sort of abilities that you bring, because that's where you're all becoming at one point, whether you become a clinician or a scientist or something in the business world and innovators, uh, you are all gonna become problem solvers and really make uh, a world of difference for children with disabilities. So thank you again. Uh, it was my pleasure to co-host with you, Tom, today. I know it was sort of last minute, but I think we did it at, at least a decent job. Yeah, thanks Manny, our ties match, so pretty good. Um, hope to see everyone next year. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can I ask the award summer students uh, to stay on the Zoom webinar for a virtual group photo? Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs>